Hey everyone, Maury Curtis Dunbar here back with Painted Studio. So nice to be here with you this afternoon. I am just loading up my camera to make sure I'm going live on my the correct page because we've had some issues with that last week. Yep, there we are. Okay, I'm going to set my camera to the uh, my uh tablet to the side so i can see what's going on as you all have comments i'm able to read them so today we are going to be working on this tray this i've had in my house forever i've had it so long i don't remember how i got it <laughs> but i was cleaning out stuff this weekend and i found it and i thought what a fun project this is going to be so let me change so that you zoom into it so you can see it and give me just a sec to do that i'm like oh come on there we go crap all righty so we're gonna move this down a bit so you can actually see what i'm doing i think that should work fine and there we go so if you can see, this is actually a table tray or a bed tray. It's got legs on the bottom, and it actually has this cool little thing that swivels so that um, when you're not using the legs, I don't know if you've ever picked up one of these and had the legs constantly falling out, so this actually locks up on the bottom. So we're going to start by painting it a neutral gray. We need to cancel out the red that's in here. So the first thing I'm going to do is, actually I'm not going to do it that way because then I have to turn it over and let it dry. So we're going to work on this part, then we're going to flip it over. It's, this is not going to be terribly glamorous today, but what we're going to be doing is canceling out the red so that we can paint blue and white on here and not have any interference. I have cleaned the tar out of this thing, let me tell you. Sorry, I gotta get this jar of set coat open. Um, sometimes, as you know, I take my gallon containers of set coat and I pour them into smaller jars for me to work with here in the studio. It keeps it from getting uh, thick, it keeps it from going funky, and it's a little more manageable. Now, if I was blending colors, I would um, pour this out into something, but we're going great straight on here with char uh, this is gravel gray set coat from faux effects. So the first thing I'm going in here and doing is getting the corners. And I know a lot of you ask why I use Set Coat so much. Set Coat is an amazing product. It was designed, uh, specifically originally designed for walls, but it is super hard and durable, so it's terrific for furniture. And the reason I use it is not just that it's super high bonding, but it has some lovely leveling properties. And um, the finish of it, even though it's 100% acrylic, dries like an oil paint, which means it dries really smooth and tight down to the surface. Um, I've brushed on furniture, and I've had people come in and say, what'd you do, spray that? I'm like, no, just brushed it on. That's how nicely this dries down to the surface. Let's see who's in here with us today. If I've got any questions, and I'm not seeing anything. There we go. Hi, Barb Williams and Cindy. Thank you for coming in. It's great to see you here. So, like I said, this is not going to be one of our more glamorous uh, and exciting lives because I'm just basically going to be painting this gray. But this is a primary step especially when I'm changing colors so substantially. So if you have something like this, this is like a barn red. I cleaned the tar out of this thing. It was filthy. Um, I did a test to make sure that the paint would adhere. But if I paint something like blue or white over this right now, that red color will read through it. What I'm doing is neutralizing it with gray 
and then I can go over it with other colors and not have that red read through in any way, shape, or form. Um, and we're going to do fun stuff with this. I'm, I'm in the mood to do something that's a little bit of chinoiserie. If you're not familiar with that term, um, during the European trade with China, um, God, my design history is coming back to me. Um, things purchased in China, teas and other goods, would come wrapped in Chinese papers that would have figures on them. And Europeans adapted them into uh, toile fabrics and stuff like that that had pagodas and dragons and ladies in kimonos and parasols walking through fields and it would be a repeating pattern but the whole idea is that it would have a spark of asian flair it is not true chinese patterning it patterning it is a european interpretation of what chinese patterning it patterning is and it was hugely popular um, in the late 1800s and as often made uh, reappearances all the way up to today. It's one of my favorite looks. Um, it leaves a lot of fun interpretations available. And the traditional colors of it are blues and whites. Um, you, I've, I've seen it done in reds. I've seen very contemporary ones done in pinks and green, like vibrant greens. But I'm going to stay with the traditional blue and white, I think, for this. Um, when I was in college, my major was design, and we had some really interesting classes. And some of them was the history of textile patterning, and chinoiserie was a part of I actually had a class, <laughs> and it's so funny, because this is Syracuse University. This is not like, you know, some... some dinky college that said it was a design school. I was at Syracuse University and one of the classes we actually had, there was a whole section on light bulbs and how light bulbs had been made and how some there had been periods where they had done very fancy filaments um, that when you plugged in light bulb, the light bulb, the filament actually lit up in different colors and you had like little scenery in the filaments and it also, but it was also very important to know these things because it taught the history and the coloring behind why we have light bulbs that are certain colors, why fluorescent, fluorescent lights tend to lead blue cold no matter what. And the reason that incandescent light bulbs were originally that sort of warm yellowy color that we all tend to like today is that it mimicked gaslight which was considered universally flattering to everybody it was warmer it was softer a little more romantic um, far less harsh and so light bulbs were specifically designed to mimic, the color of them was designed to mimic gaslight because straight un, uh, unadulterated filaments were very bright and very harsh. So there's, there's a little light bulb history for you. I learned the weirdest things. Now there's a little bubbling in here. I've poked at it. It's uh, something obviously got in there, but we're going to make that disappear. Um, I consider chipping through it, but I'm not sure what's under here, if this is solid wood or if it's chipboard. And I decided I didn't really want to blow that up and then dig through and find I had chipboard under here. So we're going to play with this as it is, and we're going to be putting texture in here, which will hide that tech, those bubbles right there. So I'm going to get the inside painted. And again, I, I remind you, as you see, you don't see me dabbing like this. Because when you dab like this, let me see if I can zoom in so you can see what's happening when you dab. Oh, 
Let's go right in here. Let's see if that's close enough. So if I dab like this, it leaves little brush marks, see? And so you don't want to do that. You want to bring your stroke smoothly across the surface. Set coat, fortunately, has nice enough open time that you can come back and smooth over things like this. That's part of how you get the product to lay down so nicely. And then you always want to come along the sides where you might have smacked it with your brush and clean up those edges. Let's open that back up a little bit so you're not stuck looking at nothing but gray space. So I'm going to come up in here. I'm going to make sure all the little crevices are filled. And we're pretty dry on top except for a few of these little crevices, but that's all right because we can turn this upside down. Now again, you know I work on parchment paper which allows me to turn things upside down where I might not normally be able to. But I think what I'm going to do, let me see if I can get an angle where you all can see this. Um, <laughs> take a sip of tea here while I figure this out. All right, let me, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a little something under here so that you can catch what I'm doing on this front edge and I can still see what I'm doing. So if you look along here, let's see if I can get a better shot for, at least for that. If you look along here, there's an embossed pattern in the wood. This actually looks like thumb this looks like thumbtacks holding it down, but it's not. It's part of the hinge for the inside. So we're going to paint, again, all of this neutral gray so I can work over these patterns. Let's see. Darn, that's a long reach on my arm. God did not make me a long-limbed creature. So I'm sort of flopping at it right now because of the angle I'm at, but I will come back and smooth it across and make sure all my brush strokes are nice and even. Um, I might be able to take this apart, but I don't trust it. If this were something that were not sitting in my basement for at least five years through a fire and everything else, um, I would probably consider taking it apart and putting it back together in a, in a more orderly fashion. But I don't know if this will hold up because I'm looking at the stuff inside and it doesn't look like it really wants to come apart. All right, so I've painted the front. I'm going to paint this side. Uh, unfortunately, it's aimed at me, not at you, because it will make my life a little easier if I just paint it this way. And I t will do a little scrubbing motion to get paint into all that texture, which I did not do here um, because I can't reach that way. So when I turn it around, I'll probably have to touch that spot up. Scrubby, scrubby, scrubby. Get that there. And you can see, even with a good coat of gray set coat on here, I'm getting a little red bleeding through. I may want to do a second coat of set coat on here to make sure I get it good and clean. I'm not loving that surface right there. I think there's a little crud on it. I'm going to take a paper towel and some denatured alcohol, because even though I cleaned this once before, I might have missed a spot, or this might just be a spot that was being stubborn to the cleaning process. Yeah, it's just a spot that was being stubborn to the cleaning process. And you can see the paint is actually coming off with alcohol. Um, so it's definitely, uh, something I want to seal up. Okay, let me get this. And then I'll get the front part that you all can see. 
and then we'll turn it over and get the ba uh, bottom. And I'm definitely checking this side because I couldn't see it as well as I would have liked. for a little bit. And let me see if I can tip this back just a little so you all can see that front part. Now, I know I'm flailing at this a little bit, but I'm kind of used to painting like this because I will tell you that in my career as a decorative painter, that is a position I've had to paint behind many, many people's toilets. Um, and if you ever want to think about how glamorous a job it is to be a decorative artist, wait until you've painted enough people's bathrooms and painted behind their toilets, you might reconsider the glamorous part of the profession. Okay. This is definitely an awkward <laughs> angle for me. And I'm also trying not to stick my hair in the bucket of paint next to me too. Take this, we're going to turn it upside down. Thank goodness for this little crossbar in here. It allows me to grab it without grabbing onto any painted surfaces. And now I can also go in, get the stuff I missed on the handles and around here on the edges. So it's very easy to miss stuff when, especially if you were painting at an odd angle like I was. Make sure everything is well coated, well sealed up. Now, if I found that this was bleeding through, if the paint was soaking through my set coat, as opposed to just the color telescoping through, tele color telescoping through means I'm seeing the red show through the gray. Bleeding means that the color is soaking through my paint and sitting up on top of the paint or blending with it. Um, telescoping means I'm seeing the red through. So if I thought I was having any bleed through, I would definitely be um, sealing this with shellac. This is going to be fun because I do want to keep these arms moving. This is going to be a little bit of a challenge. So I'm going to paint this section by section because these have got bolts on them that have been worn down. I don't even know how to get them off, which is not something normal for me. I mean, if I was, if I had been given this tray by a client, I'd probably cut the bolts off of here, take it apart and put new bolts in on the end, on the edge. At, oh Lord, I'm st struggling with my words. Uh, I'd probably put new bolts on it at the end but since this, again, is for me, I'm just going to make the best of what I've got here. And trust me, you do want to turn this at every angle that you can get at it to make sure you've covered as much as humanly possible. And you've got to be very careful doing this new. Because I've painted this, I need to be careful about painting in here so that I don't seal this to the to the surface and make it so it doesn't move. So there will be, I'm going to paint it at this angle, let it sit, then I'm going to move it and let catch another angle and let it dry. I have to really watch how I'm doing this so that I don't lose the mobility of the legs. And this is going to be the biggest pain in the neck part of it. Hey, Alice and Marilyn and Nancy, thank you for coming in. And Desiree, thank you. So we're going to work on this. 
And this may require, after I've finished doing this, I may have to go in here with a piece of sandpaper, make sure everything moves. Again, these bolts, they have been kind of stripped around here. I'm looking at, I'm, I'm seeing what you can't see, which is they have probably been taken off and replaced a couple times. And uh, yeah, they're not coming off easily. And I'm looking to see if there was, like, I could unscrew it with an Allen wrench. There is, it doesn't want to work that way. It's just going to be a challenging piece to do to make sure that these leg parts, these leg stands, stay mobile. And I'm going to have to work to make sure my brush strokes are smooth because I'm going to be fighting stuff. So really, this is the time to take time. Do not rush this. You'll have a bad result. Now I'm going to paint as much of this as I can. I, if you notice, I'm not t painting this area yet because I know I have to reach in here, get it some awkward spaces. I'm being very careful about applying paint close to the hinges. Over here, I will be very careful about where I'm applying paint on this so that I don't keep this from being able to turn. I'm not even sure how much I want to paint this spot in particular. I may just paint this and leave this red for the safety of the turn, although I can see a screw in here that I might actually be able to um, work with. It's a little stripped. We'll see if it comes out. But right now I'm going to paint everywhere underneath it. I consider doing something like this a little like doing cabinets. You really have to take... When you're doing cabinetry, you don't paint cabinets with the doors on them. You take each door off, you create a map for it, you match the hardware to the specific door, to the specific place that you remove the door from so that it can be rehung properly because, man, if you mess that up, <laughs> you can have all your doors in the kitchen in your cabinetry job hanging strangely. Um, I know because I didn't take my own advice. I didn't take what I was learned. I learned on one job and I made such a mess out of it. It took me five times longer to hang the doors than it should have because I thought, oh, I know what it is. Well, I didn't pay attention. I put all the hardware in one bag and made a very loosey-goosey map and did not mark the doors well enough so I knew where everything went. Oh, God, I made my day so hard that day. Almost ruined a really nice cabinet job, which is also part of the reason I don't paint cabinetry because I it's so annoying to me to have to do that. Um, nobody has ever lost a cabinetry job to me. As a matter of fact, I have passed on cabinetry jobs and given them over to people I know who are very good at it. To this day, I still do that. I pass on cabinetry jobs for other reasons, but also because I don't like doing them. Let's get all of this painted. And you might notice I'm not using a square brush like I normally do. Um, this is a little easier, brush is a little easier to get into awkward corners that I knew I was going to be facing on the bottom of this. Even on, um, no matter what the furniture is that I work on, I do paint the bottoms because I just like to seal it up neatly that way. I find it, um, in the long run, it ends up looking nicer. Okay. 
Okay. No. I'm not doing a complete paint job here because I want to be able to move these arms down a little bit later on to finish painting, but I do have to move them so that I can get at the edges. And I'm also getting into these handholds here because they are cross cut and a little textured in there and the paint just doesn't want to flow smoothly off my brush in them. So let me get here. Now remember, this is the first coat of paint. There will be several, several more. So really, being careful around these hinge areas is very, very important. Okay, let's come back over here. And if I weren't doing a live, I'd probably stop at one point, let things dry before I started moving them around. But because we are doing a live, I'm continuing my painting in a way that makes me fight wet paint <laughs> as I move things. Let's get in there. Let's catch this right along here. It's a spot that I did not get before because, again, I was working at an odd angle. So I'm getting under the lip of the tray. Making sure there's no globs of paint in the corners. Again, putting the thin coat on makes it easier when uh, I'll be dealing with these hinges later because everything that way will stay mobile instead of putting a big heavy coating on it's like nail polish. Sometimes thinner coats are better. Works, works out for the best in the long run. And whatever I haven't gotten in this pass, once it's dry and I start looking it over again, I will go back with a second pass and uh, clean it all up. First, first step is always the least pretty step. Open up here. So we have our first layer of neutralizing gray. 
we're going to let it dry. I'm going to come back in and see what more places I skipped where I've had to adjust carefully for the hinges, make sure nothing globbed up anywhere. This is, you know, I kind of like to go around, brush things a little bit just to make sure there's no heavy drip marks or anything that I've missed, which is very easy to do on a shape like this where you're moving it around. It's easy to miss things. I'll come back in probably with a much smaller brush after this is dry enough for me to handle better. And we'll get into the, the small spots behind the hinges in here, all of that. Oops, there's a little dribble that wants to happen right there and I don't want to see that. So we're gonna do that. That's gonna dry a little bit. I'll probably work a little later tonight getting this done. And then tomorrow we'll start with the blue and the white and the texture. But the first part we had to do today is neutralizing that red so I could completely change the color of it. Uh, one thing I wanted to show you, hang on a sec. I know we probably you probably saw it close up, but you haven't seen the whole thing in a full look. This is the twisted metal chandelier we did with the Robersons and the Whitsons primer and the gold leaf on the candle cups. I can't wait to hang this out in my yard this summer. Look how pretty that's gonna be. And I do have battery operated candles to put in it. They're sitting in my dining room. I was actually gonna photograph this in my yard, um, but <laughs> it's really cold out and nothing's blooming. It'll look prettier when I'm able to photograph it against trees. Now let me take a peek over here, see if I missed any questions. Hey Maddie, nice to see you. And Sherry, oh gosh, and Nancy, all of you, thank you so much for popping in. We're going to keep this a short one today because this is going to be a lot of work for me after I hang, uh, after I finish up with you. We're going to be doing, or what's this we? I'm going to be doing the rest of the cleanup. I'm going to check and see if I can unscrew this. And yeah, I'm glad I didn't um, chip into that because this thing itself... This is made out of particle board, so this is obviously not an expensive tray. And truly, I wish I could remember where I got it. I don't remember. I, I honestly have no idea. I just found it in my basement. Maybe it was from the previous owners and it got moved with our stuff after the fire last year. I just don't know. It's I've been at, If anybody recognizes that I got it from them, please say so because I'd love to thank you and show you what I ended up doing with it. Um, but meanwhile, we're going to let this dry, and I will see you all tomorrow. Have a great afternoon.